This is a production of PBS Charlotte. The beginning of the 20th century promised prosperity for many in the United States. But not everyone had an equal chance to pursue the American dream. Separate but equal was the law of the land. It was the era of Jim Crow. At that time, we were experiencing American apartheid. Everything was segregated by race. African Americans were treated as second-class citizens, but out of the struggle came individuals ready to lead the battle for civil rights, including North Carolina native Julius Chambers. He's probably one of the most important African American lawyers. The son of an auto mechanic, educated in segregated schools and earning a law degree from UNC, he set out to make a difference by fighting for those without a voice. He was a person who was deeply and fiercely committed to bringing about change. He believed in equal rights for everyone. And that meant going all the way to the Supreme Court. Swan becomes that case that moves Brown forward. It's the case that finally forced Charlotte Mecklenburg schools and schools across the nation to fully integrate. The case impacted millions of American students, and busing was the solution. We become the first city in America to use busing. Join us as we come to better understand how a North Carolina native impacted the American Civil Rights Movement through the courtroom. We share the catalyst for Julius Chambers' law career, a career that took him to the highest court in the land, winning cases that changed not only Charlotte, but the nation. We'll hear from those who knew him best, and you also see how Chambers' own case files are teaching a new generation. That and more on A Trail of History. Mount Gilead, North Carolina with shops and restaurants lining its main street, creating a scene reminiscent of a Norman Rockwell painting. But it's this painting, the massive mural remembering one of their own, that stands out in downtown Mount Gilead, the hometown of famed civil rights lawyer Julius Chambers. However, if you turn back the hands of time, the Mount Gilead of today is a far cry from the 1940s and 50s, when Chambers called it home, a young African-American growing up in the American South and the era of Jim Crow. Jim Crow was this complicated system that had infiltrated every aspect of American life um, by the 1950s. Um, African Americans were perceived as um, inferior, second-class citizens. It affected the neighborhoods that they lived in. It affected um, the kind of access to um, education that they got. Um, it affected the jobs that they had, and most of all, it, it infected the minds of, of, of white Americans. When they saw African Americans, they did not believe that, that African Americans were their equal. They did not believe that African Americans deserved the same kinds of things and services that they got. Everything was segregated by race. If you were a doctor, you had black patients. If you were a lawyer, you had black clients. If you were a teacher, you taught black students. If you were a preacher, you had a black congregation. These practices were legal under the doctrine of separate but equal. In the 1896 landmark case Plessy v. Ferguson, the United States Supreme Court ruled against Homer Plessy and upheld a Louisiana law known as the Separate Car Act. Under that law, railroads in the state were required to have different train cars for blacks and whites. The court's ruling set the precedent for separate but equal. For nearly six decades after Plessy v. Ferguson, many communities around the nation enacted laws and ordinances under the umbrella of separate but equal. These Jim Crow era laws and practices impacted everything from transportation, housing, medical care, education, and fairness in the judicial system. In Mount Gilead, the forces of racism and segregation proved to be a catalyst for Chambers to become a lawyer. His daddy was an auto mechanic and his daddy believed in hard work and honest living and passed those values on to Chambers. But in the work that his father did, he had to depend upon people paying him. So this small trucking company had gotten um, um, his father to do some work and um, they refused to pay for, for the service. The incident with the person not paying my grandfather and my grandfather couldn't get any justice, uh, no one would take his case, he couldn't get a lawyer. That pushed my father into civil rights, where he believed that, you know, I'm gonna make a difference and I'm gonna help everyone to achieve equal rights. That was his biggest motivation 
for him going on to, to law school and to become one of the greatest civil rights attorneys in the country. But the trucking company incident impacted the family financially. Chambers would not be able to go to a nearby private high school as planned. My father was supposed to go to Lorenberg Institute. Due to the fact that my grandfather had done some work on a truck for a, a white man and the white man refused to pay my grandfather, my father wasn't able to go to Lorenberg. So he had to continue going to public school. Mount Gilead had a public high school. These two buildings now used by the town's elementary school are what remain. But Chambers never got to go to class here because of the color of his skin. Instead, he made the 24 mile round trip to Troy, North Carolina each day. There he graduated from Peabody Academy in 1954 and then went on to college. Oh, he ended up going to North Carolina Central University. There he excelled and became really involved in um, student um, activities on campus, um, majored in history. From there, it was off to the University of Michigan, where he received his master's in history, then back to North Carolina for law school, where despite adversity, Chambers persevered. From everything that I've heard about him, relentlessly, he, he worked very hard. Um, and, and in school, he was always in the library, always studying. Um, you know, he was hungry. You know, so yes, you do have to have the opportunity, but you also have to be very hungry and take advantage of those opportunities. For African American attending UNC Law at the time, it was a struggle. I think the, the term that, that people have used about it is that what I've read is that it was like an, an icebox. You know, you didn't, um, the professors um, oftentimes didn't show you a lot of attention. Um, you, you were not expected to do well, um, but he did exceptional. He, he was the first African American to um, serve as chief editor of the um, UNC Law Review, which was a big deal. After UNC Law School, he moved to New York City to earn another advanced degree at Columbia University. It was in New York that his professional career started to take shape. Another opportunity presented itself. Chambers uh, trained in New York uh, as an intern with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And the whole idea of that program was to train lawyers to do civil rights work, primarily in the South. During his internship, he would meet another young lawyer and future law partner, James Ferguson. And as fate would have it, he happened to be at the Legal Defense Fund the same day that I happened to go down to talk with them about participating in their internship program. So I met Chambers and uh, we had a brief conversation. He asked me what I wanted to do. I told him I wanted to become a civil rights lawyer. I came to North Carolina, studied for the bar. He invited me to come join him in the practice and I did. Best decision I've made in my life. So Chambers had this idea that uh, we would form uh, a racially integrated law firm. So with the help of the Legal Defense Fund, the Field Foundation, uh, the four of us formed North Carolina's first racially integrated law firm, Lanning and Stein, who were white, Chambers and I, who were black. Ferguson, says Chambers, knew exactly what type of work to focus on for the firm. Chambers came into into this community, the Charlotte community, the North Carolina community, to bring about change and to, to break down the walls, the segregation that separated us as a society. He was always thinking ahead and always strategizing and figuring out how do we bring about this change that we set about to make. But he was a man with a purpose, there was no question about that. And he was always focused on how to fight barriers that had been erected uh, for African Americans. The firm, along with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, worked several high-profile cases fighting for equality and to end discrimination. Well, at that time, we didn't have to sit and wait for cases to come in the door. We knew that a part of our mission was to try to create a desegregated society. One case in particular, Swan versus Charlotte Mecklenburg Board of Education, would have a historic impact on not only schools in Charlotte Mecklenburg, but in the entire nation. More than five decades after Plessy v. Ferguson established the concept of separate but equal, the Supreme Court ruled that segregated schools were inherently unequal and therefore unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment. The case, known as Brown v. Board of Education, set the ball in motion for school desegregation, but the court didn't give a timeline for integration leaving it up to state and local jurisdictions to figure out the details. The lack of specific mandates brought upon confusion and violence. 
In Arkansas, President Dwight D. Eisenhower ordered federal troops to protect nine African-American students integrating Little Rock Central High. In 1970, South Carolina state troopers used tear gas to break up a mob of white protesters trying to stop African-American students from attending Lamar High School. And in North Carolina, the state's Board of Education came up with its own response to the 1954 Brown versus Board ruling. North Carolina had implemented a, a, the Persall Plan as an answer to the Brown versus Board of Education. The Persall Plan um, put rules in place that forced individual families, black families, if you wanted your child to go to a better school and, and a school that had better um, resources, you had to apply individually. And so that's how they slowed um, the integration process uh, up. And so what you had were, were a bunch of um, token integration cases. In the mid-1960s, Darius and Vera Swan lived in the Biddleville neighborhood and worked at Johnson C. Smith University. They put in an application for their son to attend school closer to home. Darius and Vera wanted their son to go to um, Seversville Elementary School, but they were denied because of this Persall plan. And so they wrote this very passionate letter about the need for children um, who are going to be our future leaders to, in order for them to lead, they need to be in integrated settings from a very early age. Gentlemen, on behalf of my wife and myself, I am writing to request the assignment of our son, James Everett Swan, age six, to the Seversville School. When the board denied the request, the family took legal action. Chambers and the NAACP Legal Defense Fund led the multi-year legal battle all the way to the Supreme Court. And in 1971... He shows how all of this is, is transpiring, how um, all of these, these corners that are being cut um, by the, um, the city leaders, all of the ways that they are finding um, to um, circumvent uh, uh, complying with Brown, and busing becomes a, a way. I'm not sure exactly how they came up with this idea that busing um, would, would work as a way to integrate the schools, but it, it becomes um, this, um, I guess, the key to integrating the schools. We become the first city in America to use busing as a way to make Brown come true, to, to, to realize the, the true um, um, nature of Brown and that Brown is supposed to um, do away with these uh, unconstitutional um, segregated school systems. And so Brown, I mean, Swan becomes that case that moves Brown forward. Ten days after the decision, President Richard Nixon had this to say. The law is that where we have segregation in schools as a result of governmental action, in other words, de jure, that then busing can be used under certain circumstances to deal with that problem. And so we will comply with that situation and we will work with the southern school districts, not in a spirit of coercion, but one of cooperation as we have during the past year in which so much progress has been made in uh, getting rid of that kind of a system. Back here in Charlotte, integration in the classroom begins and busing becomes a way of life. So I'm originally from Charlotte, North Carolina, grew up um, on the west side. Uh, so I'm a child of busing. I had nothing but good experiences. I went to very diverse schools. I, 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 I mingled with all kinds of people from different economic backgrounds, um, races, uh, ethnicities. Today, Dr. Willie Griffin is the staff historian at Charlotte Levine Museum of the New South. He says the impact of the Swan case goes way beyond school integration. And this um, helps Charlotte attract businesses. It helps attract um, people who are looking to leave the North and Midwest. They don't want to go to places like um, Birmingham, Little Rock, or, or Montgomery because of what happened during the, the sort of the televised phase of the movement. That's all these places become um, synonymous with resistance. You know, it's an, uh, an, an unwillingness to progress. And so Charlotte sheds that, um, that image because of its effort to, um, to make busing um, um, work. According to his son, Julius Chambers argued eight cases at the Supreme Court, including two major anti-discrimination cases. My father is undefeated in the Supreme Court. Only man that's gone eight, he's eight no at the Supreme Court, which is, says a lot for anybody that gets to the Supreme Court. Longtime friend and law partner James Ferguson says when Chambers addressed the court, the court listened. I remember when I 
first saw Chambers argue a case in the Supreme Court. He stood up and he, in his usual fashion, barely spoke above a whisper. But when he stood up to speak, it seemed that the judges all leaned over the bench to listen and to make sure they heard what he had to say. Chambers' success gave him a spotlight during the civil rights movement of the 1960s and 70s, but that also came with risks and violence. You know, my mother and father, they, they dealt with a lot with the fire bombings, and that's not even to say how many threatening phone calls he may have received or she may have received uh, because, you know, I was young at that age, and uh, they really did try to keep us sheltered from, uh, from any of the uh, issues that were going on. But the violence never stopped Chambers from doing the work, and both son Derek and law partner James Ferguson say it was never about the fame or attention for Julius Chambers. A lot of cases he took on pro bono just to help because he saw the need to help someone. He was a guardian angel. You don't, you don't have people come along like that in this day and age. Um, it wasn't about the money or the fame. It was about genuinely helping people and making sure that they were treated equally. And Chambers always found a way to help. People don't know about the people with no money who would stream into the office and needed help. And they don't know that Chambers would sometimes be seeing clients at seven, eight, nine o'clock at night, six, seven o'clock in the morning, uh, because they were people who needed help. And he was trying to find a way to help them, not because he expected recognition, not because he expected to, uh, to make money, but because he wanted to make a difference. And he did make that difference. And he made that difference in cases that people heard about, like the ones that are well known, and he made that difference in cases that nobody but the client knew about. But he was committed to helping where he could. So there's Myers Park, and then there's Harding right there. And then there's Pineville down here. At the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, the Swan case continues teaching new generations, thanks to instruction archivist Randy Beam. Instruction archivist, basically, I do all of the instruction for the archives here at J. Murray Atkins Library. The university archives include boxes of the actual documents and maps from Julius Chambers and the historic Swan case. These massive maps were used by Chambers to help plan how busing might work. So I definitely think having the maps um, really shows the insight into how he thought integration might work and the different solutions that he was trying to propose himself. The papers are a great window to that time period. They're also a great window into Julius Chambers as a person. He really worked within the system to change the system. And so I think it's a great opportunity too for students to realize that sometimes activism you know, it isn't what you see on the news all the time. Sometimes activism is very, um, is something that happens behind the scenes. Beams uses the Chambers papers in different classes at UNCC. So my day to day, I usually do about two classes a day. Um, and the classes really focus on different subjects across the university. So I try to connect our locally focused collections with the different disciplines across campus and connect that history of the city to the students. She says they want the collection used. Absolutely, that's why we have the papers. If people don't use the papers, then there really is no reason for us to have them. And don't worry, no white gloves required. They're not handled with gloves. That is an archivist um, myth that we're trying to dispel. Um, <laughs> gloves are usually used for the oldest, oldest books. Um, and they're also used for photograph negatives. Um, so you no white gloves required here. The collection even includes a copy of the Swan Letter that was originally sent to the school board. I always have them read um, the letters from the Swans to Julius Chambers, so that really sort of kicked off 
the beginning of him taking their case. I always have them look at that. I also have them too look at some of the mail that he received during his time period. Um, on this case, some of it was very positive and they and people really felt strongly for the Swans and they really felt that the schools should be desegregated and then there are some cases where people are, are definitely in opposition to that. So it's a great way to get students, especially history students, um, to think about how they might use archival sources. Um, it's also a really great way to get students who might just be really curious to think about how history might fall into their discipline. She says the papers to this day have an impact. The thing that I've definitely realized after looking through all these letters is that all of these people just want a better opportunity, especially for their children. Um, and to think that this is even, this is about 14 years after the Brown versus Board of Education, but the Charlotte Mecklenburg Board of Education was basically able to um, throt the system and essentially still keep segregation in place despite the Supreme Court. I think it's very important for our institution to take on that mission because we do try to collect locally. Um, we are a city, we are a university that's closely tied with our city. A lot of our growth came about when the city started to expand. Um, I also think it's really important that we have these papers too because students get to interact with them all the time whenever they want to. Um, and I think a lot of the time students have better discoveries than maybe experienced researchers. Although he's unfortunately not with us anymore, his collection still gives us a window into how change can be impacted here in Charlotte and how people can use their means and their talents to change the city. I think we should care too because Julius Chambers' papers are such a wonderful example of how one person can make a huge difference in the community around them. In the 1980s, Chambers went back to New York City to head up the NAACP Legal Defense Fund until 1993, when he accepted the job of chancellor at North Carolina Central University, his alma mater. Eventually, he returned to Charlotte and to the firm he started all those years ago. He was preceded in death by his wife, Vivian. Julius Chambers died in 2013, leaving a legacy of work for the betterment of the community and the nation. If we don't continue the legacy of putting out stories about what happened during this civil rights movement, the early times of, of, of integration in Charlotte. If we don't talk about it, we would, the kids would never be exposed to what the struggle was. You know, Julius Chambers, again, he's, he is really responsible for um, moving the work um, of not only education forward at, after Brown, he's, he's responsible for moving um, employment discrimination and segregation efforts, efforts to fight against those things um, following the 1964 Civil Rights Act. That's his legacy. To, to look at him, I mean, if you had to frame it, um, he's probably one of the most important um, African-American lawyers, if not lawyers, period, in the 20th century. Um, save for Thurgood Marshall, you know, um, he it really had that kind of impact on, on the country. I hope that what people will see and come to understand is that Chambers was a person who sacrificed himself for others. He was a person who was deeply and fiercely committed to bringing about change. And his interest was not in building a legacy for himself, building a name for himself, or doing anything in particular for himself, but he saw his role as being prepared by getting the, the, the best possible legal education you could get and um, being willing to make sacrifices to do it. Julius Chambers was born in an era where racial inequality was the law of the land, but Chambers used education to impact change. He used the injustice against his father as motivation to fight for change. He gave voice to so many who didn't have a voice, a say, and fought for equality in education. From the small town of Mount Gilead, 
Julius Chambers began an improbable journey to reshape our country. He challenged the highest court in the land to see the injustice and force change, one that reshaped our story through every classroom in the nation. of PBS Charlotte.